Hello, dear saints from all over the world. Greeting, peace and grace in our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. In today's study, we're going to look at the question of who is the restrainer that Paul speaks about in his letters in uh, Thessalonians. Now, okay, first of all, the word restrainer is not found anywhere in the King James Version Bible. Not one place. So that should answer your, our question, who is the restrainer? And that'll be the end of our lesson, so I'll see you in the next video. No, I'm just kidding. But there's a touch of seriousness to this also. Isn't, isn't it something that most confusion we have today lies because of all the fake Bibles out there? Using different words, different meanings, hiding things, twisting things, adding words removing words, removing entire verses at times. So dangerous, so very dangerous. I, I highly suggest you stick with the King James Bible alone. And, you know, in answering this one question, it'll actually answer many other questions at the same time. So it's a good subject to make a video about, and especially considering the times we're in right now. And also, because there's so much false teaching out there concerning the church and the rapture and the Antichrist and uh, the tribulation period, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. There's a lot of confusion. And there's people out there right now claiming to be part of the body of Christ who absolutely hate anyone who rightly divides God's word. And the reason why they hate us, folks, is because we bring their house of false teaching crumbling to the ground. You know, truthfully, they fear us, and that's why they attack us. These are wolves in sheep's clothing. These are the ones to watch out for. These are the ones who love the law and hate grace. They have no understanding what dispensations are, and, you know, they attack people who have taught dispensation in the past all the way straight to Paul because Paul is the first one that started teaching dispensation, and these people don't understand that. You know, they despise grace. Because their father despises grace and he hates God and his children. Okay, so I had to let that out because you know there's there's so much people there's so many people out there that just hate rightly dividing. And uh anyway, I just can't stand to see it. I and I can't stand to see so many brothers and sisters out there confused because of it. So anyway, let's move on with our study. Who is the restrainer? Just who who he is, why uh Paul mentions him. And, uh, you know, where the restrainer is, what the restrainer is all about, and how the restrainer is going to work. Now, like I said earlier, the word restrainer is not in the King James Bible, but we're going to continue using that word because everybody understands, you know, what we're talking about. So there's a pattern, okay? And in order to rightly divide, we need to answer the who, what, where, when, and how types of questions. You know, right division is the only method that's going to get to the bottom of God's word and what it means for us today. Paul uses the word withholdeth and letteth in the letter he writes to the Thessalonians, but we're going to, like I said we're going to be using the word restrain and restrainer for the sake of this teaching, okay? So, you know, just to avoid all confusion and hopefully it'll be a refreshing to many of you out there. So Paul writes in his letter and uh, it's not just an ordinary letter it, either. It's uh, This letter is more of a rebuke of sorts. And Paul sends this letter, actually the second letter, because he gets wind of a disturbing rumor. And the rumor is, is that there's somebody out there forging his name on letters. They're writing letters and they're signing it with Paul's name. And, you know, they were sending letters specifically to the Thessalonians in this situation with the sole purpose of undermining Paul's authority, okay, and confusing them. And we see a lot of that happening even today. So this forger was spreading false teaching, okay? And specifically, the counterfeit letter sent to the Thessalonians said that the day of the Lord had already begun. They were saying that they were in the middle of the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week, uh, and the rapture never happened, and they were about to face the Antichrist head on. So as you can imagine, the Thessalonians were extremely distraught over this because Paul had taught them earlier quite the opposite, you know, because the, the letters that were forged and had Paul's names on it 
or Paul's name on it was confusing everybody. So they didn't know what was going on, all right? So Paul, he gets wind of this fake letter and he writes a personal letter to the Thessalonians to straighten out the entire mess. And that's where we get 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from. Okay, look here at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that ye be not, be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. Okay, there he acknowledges that it is a forged letter. Now here we see also that uh, nor by the letter as from us. Okay, he's letting again, like I said, he's letting them know that it was a, a forged letter they'd received, and it wasn't from him. It was a fake letter, and he's telling them not to believe it. Now we see here again, continuing on in verse two, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now notice the day of Christ here. Okay. We know by the context of the letter that Paul writes that the period Paul's talking about here is the day of the Lord, okay? It's Daniel's 70th week, the seven-year tribulation period. So if Paul's talking about the day of the Lord, then why does the letter say the day of Christ here? Now, the difference in the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, okay, and that's a study in itself, and it's extremely important that the body of Christ understands the difference. Okay, and actually I have a study on that lined up for the future as well. So, But for the purpose of this video, I'll give you a short, just a short explanation between the two. So you understand the context a little bit better as we move along. Okay, now simply, the day of Christ here is for the body of Christ. Okay, Paul mentions the day of Christ in several of his books. And he mentions it as that day or the day, okay? And this special day, the day of Christ, is our gathering unto our Lord. It's the rapture. And it's also, it involves the judgment seat of Christ. You know, commonly called the Bema judgment. Now, under the mystery gospel that was revealed to Paul, there are several uh, subsets of mysteries, okay? There are many mysteries in the mystery itself. And for an example, I just mentioned some, the rapture and the Bema seat and all these other things and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those were all the mysteries revealed to Paul alone. So we'll all stand before the Lord Jesus one day at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to answer for everything we've done, whether it's bad or good. You know, the things we've done from day one of our salvation to the day we stand before our Lord. And the day of Christ, like I mentioned, is for the saints, the church, the body of Christ Jesus. Now also note that the day of Christ is part of the mystery. As I said, Paul's gospel, our gospel, the gospel given to Paul by revelation directly from Jesus Christ himself, straight to the apostle Paul. Now the day of Christ is also mentioned in Paul's books, okay? You won't find it in the Old Testament or the four gospels or the last gospels in the New Testament. Only in Paul's books will you find this, these mysteries. Because as I said, the day of Christ involves the body of Christ, which was kept a secret in God from the very foundation of creation until the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah and Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies and the law, okay? The majority of prophecies, like 99% of the prophecies, but he did fulfill the law, okay? Now, only after did God reveal this secret mystery of the gospel of grace, salvation through faith alone to the Apostle Paul okay did that take place so now the important thing to remember is that the day of Christ is one of the mysteries like I said within several mysteries now the day of the Lord okay the day of the Lord is not for the body of Christ the difference the big difference is the day of the Lord is all throughout the Bible it wasn't part of the mysteries it was a special period of time that all the prophets wrote about and the day of Lord of the Lord was very well known to the Jews the nation of Israel they knew all about it and we read all about that in Daniel and Jeremiah Isaiah Zechariah Jesus himself in the four Gospels Ezekiel all these people you know Jesus plus the prophets were given visions and prophecies concerning 
the day of the Lord. It wasn't a secret to them. And like I said, it was especially no secret to the nation of Israel. Okay, so one was a secret, which is the day of Christ, and the other one was not a secret. It was very well known. So the day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ Jesus, and it includes his 1,000 year millennial reign. All right. So we see here that the day of Christ being for the body of Christ is a secret given to Paul containing the secrets of the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ plus more and the day of the Lord was not a secret but was prophesied even all the way back starting in Genesis ending in Revelation minus Paul's 13 books of course. Now the reason why it's so important to understand this is because in order to understand 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 this letter where it says the day of Christ is at hand you need to understand that there's a huge difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord and here's why Paul's quoting the forged letter here okay in the forged letter the forger writes day of Christ but the context is all about the day of the Lord this isn't a mistake here at all okay and there's a reason why it says the day of Christ and not the day of the Lord now there's a lot of people out there that just dismiss this as being a translation error and in doing so they end up misunderstanding what Paul's trying to say here okay and then they think that the day of Christ is the same thing as the day of the Lord then they end up with foolish teachings like the post rap uh, the post rapture doctrine saying that the falling away has to happen before the rapture and the falling away is for the church and the rest of the confusion that's out there all right and it's all because people don't rightly divide and actually a lot of it has to do with people not trusting God's Word in the King James Bible. They don't trust it, so they change words into their own words, and that creates confusion than other uh, religions, and the craziness goes on and on and on. So one tiny mistake breeds other mistakes, and then total confusion erupts, and that's why it's so very important to rightly divide, keeping things in context, knowing all about dispensations, and so on. Okay, so understanding that the forge, the forger got it wrong actually proves that the letter wasn't from Paul. And Paul saying, look, you guys know that the day of Christ has nothing to do with the day of the Lord. I taught you guys all this before. And, and Paul, you know, had talked to them all about the day of Christ. They knew that the day of Christ was specifically for them and the rapture and etc. All the other stuff. That's why they were all confused they were scared because they thought that the rapture didn't happen thinking that they were stuck in the day of the Lord and it was upon them and now you start seeing uh, you know what's going on here so Paul continues in verse 3 let no man deceive you by any means for that day that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that men that man of sin be revealed and uh, the son of perdition so Paul says, don't be deceived. You already know that before the Lord returns, I told you about specific events that will take place before it happens. First, the Antichrist will lead many astray. God will allow this to happen immediately after the church is raptured. He'll cause a delusion to take place. He'll make them all believe in the Antichrist. They'll forsake. Now forsake, here's the word apostasy. I have a video on that on my channel, the falling away. Now first the apostasy, the falling away caused by the delusion that will follow the Antichrist. Okay, Then at the halfway point, three and a half years into the seven year tribulation, Paul says the Antichrist will be revealed for who he truly is, the lawless one, when he desecrates the temple, the abomination of desolation. The Jews see him for who he truly is at this point. And they'll know he's the Antichrist. The elect will see it because they're not going to be under the spell of delusion. They'll see the lawless one. They're told to flee to the mountains where God will protect and provide for them for the last half of the seven year period. Okay. Now in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things and now you know you know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time 
for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, Paul here is describing something, okay? Something that's been holding the evil back, restraining uh, complete lawlessness from occurring till the timing is right, okay? To fulfill prophecy and to usher in the day of the Lord. Now, some of the theories out there, and I stress the word theories here, okay, because they're all wrong, but we need to cover some of the counterfeits out there, okay, so we see the genuine, and that way I'll be able to show you what's true and what's not, okay, and the genuine will stand out a lot better if we point out the counterfeits, okay, and hopefully it'll make more sense to you and put the these false teachings in the grave where they belong. Now, some of the theories on who the restrainer is include the Roman Empire, the Jewish state, the human government, uh, the Gentile dominion, uh, even Satan, even the church, and the Holy Spirit, okay? But out of this group of theories here, two of them stand out, the church and the Holy Spirit. Now, in this dispensation, you can't have one without the other, okay? So we need to look at both of them, but more specifically, we need to take a look at the Holy Spirit. Without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ wouldn't exist. Because Paul's gospel tells us that one of the mysteries is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Our being placed in the body of Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is our seal, our guide, our helper, and our comforter. Now first, let's look at uh, why God sends His Spirit down to the body of Christ. Take a look at John 16. Now Jesus is speaking to the disciples here. He's telling them about the comforter. And we know the Comforter is the Holy Spirit, but look closely at how Jesus describes this Comforter here. In John 16, 7 through 15. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now howbeit when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now, take a look at verse 8 with me real, real quick. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness and of judgment now we know that the antichrist will be given the power at the beginning of daniel's 70th week okay the beginning of the seven year tribulation we know this because our lord jesus opens the first seal and he gives permission unto the antichrist to reign over the earth now by doing that he's removing the first part of verse 8 reproof of sin then righteousness, then judgment. The first seal is indirectly proportional to verse 8, okay? Now, plus, we also know that God will create a powerful, a strong delusion for people to believe the lie, to believe the Antichrist story, if you will. And this delusion is exactly in opposition to the Holy Spirit's functions of revealing it, the truth, okay? In verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me again one of the Holy Spirit's functions is to reveal sin to reprove evil to expose the sinfulness in the world also in direct opposition to the first seal and especially to the delusion the lie that the man of sin will be pouring out upon the earth during the whole time now God will cause them to believe the lie so we can't have him revealing the lie at the same time, right? In one hand, 
He's causing this delusion to prosper. And on the other hand, he's revealing all the delusion of sinfulness to be seen. They don't mix. They're opposite powers. So we can't have both going on at the same time. In verse 10 of righteousness, because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. In verse 13, <clears throat> again, the Holy Spirit of truth. He guides us into all truth, and he reveals things to come. Another direct opposition to the power of the Antichrist okay, will be given during that time. And the direct opposition to the delusion that must take place to punish the wicked because they'll believe not in the first place. So let's take a look at how Paul continues in this letter in 2 Thessalonians verses 8 through 12. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with all brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness now he that withholdeth the restrainer is without a doubt the power of the Holy Spirit and more specifically, the method in how the Holy Spirit functions, okay, functions right now in the body of Christ. The way the Holy Spirit functions in time past in the Old Testament and through the four Gospels is much different than the way it acts right now in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit being God doesn't change, but the way the Holy Spirit functions can and will change, just like dispensations. The Holy Spirit indwells each member of the body of Christ today. And we see its actions in John 16. Jesus tells us what the functions that it has are and what they are in the world today through the body of Christ. And it, it, uh, it, it was made complete when the mystery of the Holy Spirit's function was made known to Paul okay, by revelation. Now the restrainer is the Holy Spirit's function today. But as soon as the rapture happens, when we're taken out of here, so too is the restraining power of the Holy Spirit. Those functions will stop, and the Holy Spirit will then revert back to the way it functioned in the Old Testament and in the four Gospels. So that's not saying that the Holy Spirit won't be here on earth during Daniel's 70th week, because it will be here on earth, and it will be functioning through the two witnesses and the 144,000, the elect. Uh, remnant of the Jews and, and so on and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will be once again in full force through God's people much like it was during the time Jesus was on earth all the miracles and the wonders that were given to the disciples that they were performing the tongues the healings and so on will be here during Daniel's week but all the functions we saw in John 16 will be removed and those are the ones that oppose the power of evil of sin the Antichrist performing wonders and also the strong delusion that God's going to pour out on mankind during that time. So in conclusion, the day of Christ is as different than the day of the Lord as daytime is from nighttime. The day of Christ is a time of anticipation, of joy, of blessing, of reward. And the day of the Lord is a time of terror, trials, horror, tribulation, destruction, and wrath. Paul taught the Thessalonians that the two days were different and not to be deceived by anyone, okay, who taught that the church would go through the tribulation or the day of the Lord. Paul taught that Christ would remove the church, the body of Christ, before that day, because we're not appointed unto wrath. Saints, Paul's doctrine is as valid today as it was 1900 years ago. It's our doctrine. There's no other gospel for the body of Christ. Christ's second advent occurs in two phases, okay? In the first phase, the Lord returns for the body of Christ. In the second phase, the Lord returns to destroy his enemies. But in 
more specifically at the second phase the Lord sends his angels to uh, take part in blowing of the trumpets in the vials and so on okay the Lord will send his angels to take care of all the wrath business upon the earth during Daniel's 70th week and at the second coming the Lord will come with his angels and his and the wicked will be removed and the righteous will be left to go into the earthly kingdom so in closing for real this time in closing two things number one you can't have two different methods of salvation taking place over the seven years at the same time you can't have one for the body of Christ and one for the nation of Israel okay one being of faith alone and the other one of being faith plus works the law it just won't happen that's why the dispensation of the body of Christ must end first then the seven-year tribulation will begin and the dispensation of the kingdom will start up again the dispensation of law number two you can't have the Holy Spirit filled body of Christ on earth while the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is removed okay and then God gives full reign over the power uh, full reign to the Antichrist you know those two just won't mix just like the dispensations of grace or the dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the kingdom don't mix they're separate entities for two different groups of people for two different time periods all right so I hope this all made sense to you and I hope it edified somebody out there and uh, thanks for studying with me Saints I love you all and we're going home soon very soon brothers and sisters very soon indeed and I'll see you on my next video